Well, welcome everyone to uh, Women Living Well After 50, a Facebook Live event. And today we're going to be talking about gut health. And uh, I'm delighted to introduce you to Ange Sinclair, the digestive detective. And she's going to talk to us about what the, what the gut is, why, what symptoms are of poor gut health, and just give us some tips on how we can improve the health of our gut because it is an important function in our body. So welcome, Anne. And Hi, Sue. How are you going? Thanks, yeah. thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, it's lovely to have you. Now, before we get started um, on the nitty gritties, uh, I just wanted to ask you if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, um, the digestive detective, uh, and what you do um, before we go. Okay, so basically, as a naturopath, I help women purge the pain, beat the bloat, and get to the root cause of what's happening to them digestively. Um, and I do this by um, educating and empowering them to become their own digestive detective because I think it's, um, you know, as adults, we need to be able to fix some of our problems ourselves and know what things that we can do to improve our own life. So I do that generally through one on one consultations, and I'm looking um, shortly to start a membership. So um, that's basically me in a nutshell. Uh, but I'm a, I'm a naturopath, I'm a nutritionist and a herbalist as well. Okay, all, all right. Yeah. Oh, well, that sounds pretty impressive. So um, I'd like to bring things back down to the basics. So I'm going to ask some basic questions. And firstly, where is our gut and what function does it have in the body? So when people talk about gut, um, there's there's lots of different levels. So we have a stomach, then we have a small intestine, and then we have a colon. When people refer to our gut, mostly they're talking about our small intestine or our colon generally. Um, and most people, for example, for our, our um, colon, they talk about the microbiome. And so our microbiome basically is this really hustling, busy environment that's full of um, bacteria, protozoans, funguses and viruses that live with us. Um, Actually, we're more bacteria than we are human. Um, and so that surprises a lot of people that, oh. you know, we have more bacterial cells than we have human cells. Um, so that's basically where the gut is. Um, and it functions for a lot of processes in our body. It helps us make vitamins. It helps us um, make hormones and neurotransmitters that, that um, you know, process, help us process our brain thoughts and stuff, um, helps us get our serotonin to make us happy and our melatonin to make us go to sleep. Um, so all those sorts of things. Um, it stimulates our immune system um, and it also protects us against pathogens and on a, on a, most women love this level, on a, on a basic level, it helps us with our fat storage and how we, um, you know, whether we can keep our weight maintained or whether we can't. So um, it's it's got lots and lots of functions and we probably still don't know them all yet, um, mm. but we're getting more clearer on it as time goes by. Mm. I mean, um, you sort of, of late, well, I'd say the last couple of years or so, gut health has really come to the fore, hasn't it? It's everywhere, yeah. you know, yeah. and uh, and I sometimes when it's everywhere, you sort of, it loses its... Um, impact but I think that a lot of people go oh yeah gut health but if you ask them what it was you would they wouldn't know so thanks for for clearing that up now what would the symptoms be of uh, you know say if we had poor gut health what are some of the symptoms that can result from that well there's lots so things like um, bloating that's probably one of the most common ones so yep. bloating excessive gas um, reflux is a really big one um, constipation, um, diarrhea, IBS, those sorts of symptoms are all pretty big. But then you can get nauseousness, um, you know, ulcers, uh, and can go off into other conditions. So conditions like um, rheumatoid arthritis and um, chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia, all of those sorts of conditions all come back to our gut health as well because it, all of the um, neurotransmitters and hormones and stuff we need to function properly, all start in our gut, and if they're not working properly because our gut's not working properly, um, it can branch off into other conditions. So it's always a good place to start if you've got lots of those signs and symptoms is come back to your gut because it's a mm. good chance that's where it's starting. Yes. Um, one of the uh, 
mem the, the members on the Facebook page had asked previously, you know, how stress is related to gut and gut health. And you've sort of covered a little bit of it there, but did you want to expand on that? Oh, or? Yeah. Stress does really impact our gut bacteria, um, probably more than they know. Um, you know, and there's some really good research coming out now that they know that stress actually kills gut bacteria. Um, so when you're living in that um, chronic state of high cortisol, we're totally stressed all the time, which for most people is pretty much the norm now. Um, mm. I have people say, well, I'm not really that stressed. And then they list this long laundry list of things that they're actually doing and things that are happening in their life. And you just look at it and go, it's impossible with all that going on for you not to be stressed. So mm. I think we're, we're living in that more than we probably ever have. Um, and that high stress level just takes out some of our good bacteria as do lots of other things um, environmentally as well. So um, we live also in a toxic environment pretty much and that damages our gut. So adding high stress to that just makes more damage and does more impact. Um, mm. and, and the other things too is we've changed our behaviours too. We don't do things how we used to do which would protect our gut. So, for example, when we... Um, we would sit down and have breakfast and then we'd sit down and have lunch and dinner. Um, now we're eating in the car, we're on the phone and we're eating, we're watching TV and we're eating, we're standing at the bench putting stuff in our mouth. We're not even paying attention, mm. to, you know, and that really impacts our gut bacteria as well um, and the stress that comes along with that physical stress. Um, people don't even realise that that is a stress for them. Mm. And of course, the last six or well, it's more than six months now, but with the COVID-19, yeah. that would have had a huge impact on people with their stress, with what we're yeah. eating. I mean, um, you know, I, I can't think of the percentage, but I was listening the other day about how people have gained weight during yeah. that time. Yeah. And uh, it's probably been because they can't really go out. You know, at one point they were probably just... Um, uh, eating lots of processed foods mm. and things like that and, and, of course, stress and worry about the situation wouldn't yeah. help either. So that's compounded, I think. You throw that on top of everything yeah. else that you've got yeah. in your life and it's, yeah, um, yeah. yeah it's quite difficult. Um, now, I was thinking too about... Um, I've heard of, oh, well, I take probiotics mm -hmm. and I know that this is sort of like a, a big area, but I'm just touching on a few things today because um, you're actually going to be a guest on my podcast, uh, mm -hmm. it, you know, which will be great. So we can go into more detail then. But today it's just covering the basics about gut mm -hmm. health. But I wondered if we could just touch a little bit on pre Biotics, probiotics, and I heard you in an interview over on Strong Healthy Women talking about postbiotics, mm -hmm. which I hadn't heard of before. So I suppose it's a bit difficult, but can you give us it all in a nutshell? <laughs> yeah, no, look, in a couple of um, sentences, I think prebiotics are foods that um, they're basically non digestible fibers. Um, when we eat them, they don't really do much for us, but when they go through our small intestines and into our colon, they feed our gut bacteria. So for me, I actually think prebiotics are the most important things. Um, and they mm -hmm. you them in basically um, fruit and veg, grains, legumes, nuts and beans. And okay. so one thing I'd like to say about prebiotics is that all prebiotics are fibres, but not yep. all fibres are prebiotic. Um, and okay. I, so that's a really important distinction for people to get. So um, even though you're eating fibre, you might not be eating prebiotics. And I think it's really important that we do eat prebiotics because what they essentially do, they're a fuel source for our um, colon bacteria. They help us make short chain fatty acids, which basically is the fuel for our, for our colon cells. Um, mm -hmm. They help us go to the bathroom better um, and more regularly. Um, they also provide um, gut bacteria integrity and support uh, and they also influ influence our immune system. So they teach our immune system how to behave essentially. Um, mm. They also stop inflammation, help with our blood sugar, are good for our bone health. And these are everyday foods. We used to think they were things like onions, asparagus, Jerusalem artichoke, but now we know that there's a lot more foods 
um, that they are and things that you'd be eating every day. So I encourage people to eat lots of prebiotic foods. Um, and in comparison to probiotics, so probiotics are from uh, are living microorganisms that have been um, isolated out of different things. So, for example, um, lactobacillus, they discovered that in about the 1900s and they found it in yogurt. Um, uh -huh. Called Eli Mkechnikov, I think his name was, and he isolated it because he saw Bulgarian um, farmers eating this um, yogurt, and he thought, well, there's something in that that's making them really strong and really healthy. So he um, narrowed down the bacteria, and then he, um, you know, put that into production. So you can see it's been around since the 1900s. So mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't act in the same way as. Um, a prebiotic so there's lots of misconceptions about probiotics they actually um, change the environment rather than help the gut bacteria so there's a misconception that probiotics will help us um, grow back um, gut bacteria but that's not necessarily the case it, it, it's more that it helps the environment you know it, it produces the um, a conducive environment for bacteria to grow um, rather than, you know, um, feed our good gut bacteria. So that's those two. And then postbiotics, this was my um, prediction for what's coming up in the future. Um, and oh, okay. I'm starting to see a little bit of it come out now. So postbiotics just means prebiotics and probiotics together. Okay. So they'll be in the same container. Um, and we're just starting to see that trickle in a little bit now, but I reckon it will explode next year because it's sort of getting a bit of traction in the state. So normally we follow on behind them. So I think that will happen for us next year. Um, will that be good or bad? I'm not sure. Um, will The jury's still out on that. Um, with probiotics, the thing for me is um, there are different species of probiotics of different species of bacteria. I think um, there's been lots and lots of research done around single strains for certain conditions. So, for example, if you have a food allergy um, or acne or uh, eczema or something like that, the bacteria that you should be looking for is a Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG. Um, and so if you just went and bought a probiotic off the shelf, it might not be the right one that will help you with that. So I'm more about getting people to... Have a conversation with a health practitioner about what probiotic will best manage the condition they're trying to um, manage. Um, but if it's for general health, getting one that is a broad spectrum with lots of bacteria in it is is a good thing. Um, mm. So I was going, yeah, I was going to ask you about that because um, I don't take them all the time, but on and off I've um, taken, you know, a little supplement, a probiotic. Yeah. But I didn't realise that. Um, you know, there were different ones for different, yeah. Yeah. you know, depending on, on you and, and the way your body works and what allergies you might have or, or so forth. So um, I just take those occasionally, <coughs> excuse me, but, you know, do you think that supplements are good or should we be getting them from food? Oh, look, I think, I think you need a combination of both. Um, I think food has changed a lot to how it was years ago. You know, we know for sure that we're not getting the same amounts of selenium. Um, there's not the same amount of magnesium in the soil. There's not the same amount of iron and all those things in the soil. So I think you need to do a combination of both. Um, and I think now as well there is, you know, once upon a time all food was organic. <laughs> uh, now there's it's conventional and organic. So I think that mixes changes the mix a little bit too. Um, you know, I've seen lots of people say, oh, I don't think organic food's that great, yet a study about three or four years ago out of Sweden saying it might not change the nutrient concentration of the, the food, but the toxicity of the food that you eat um, when you buy conventional as opposed to organic um, is quite significantly different. Um, so it's worth doing um, some foods organically if you can just to help you know, with that gut bacteria and and um, all of those sorts of things. So I think that's mm. important too. Mm. And uh, I think too that if your gut isn't healthy, you probably have um, issues with, um, excuse me, I've got a bit of a tickle, digestion or maybe even constipation, things like that. Mm. So what do you suggest for people who are suffering from those 
sort of conditions? Well, there's a couple of things. So um, with constipation, there's about 15 different reasons that people can be constipated. And I like to start with the easy ones. And the first one I'd say to you is this one. Uh, not enough people drink enough water. Um, and I'm one of those people. So if I put it in the jar and it looks at me all day, I'll at least get round to drinking my two litres. Um, yeah. So I think that's a really big one. I think um, the way we eat has changed. You know, once upon a time we would get um, home from work, we would sit down, we would relax for a minute and then we'd eat. Now, like we talked about before, we're eating on the run, we're picking kids up and we're dropping kids off, we're, we're busy, busy, busy. We're not mm. getting that rest and digest state that we should be in before we eat. Um, mm. And that makes a true difference to how we digest and how we absorb because if you are um, rushing around doing stuff and then you're putting food into your mouth, you, you're in that fight or flight. And so if everybody ha is, experiences fight or flight, it's when basically our body stops making hormones and it stops us from digesting food and it's saying to us, you're going to be attacked, run away from whatever it is that's going to attack you. So it sends all of the blood to our arms and legs so we can run away. And people are eating dinner in that frame of mind. So they're putting food into their body, but they're in this fight or flight um, state and then they can't digest it. So then they're likely to get gas, bloating and um, constipated uh, reflux as well on top of that. Um, and they don't realise that if they took that extra five or ten minutes or sat at the table before they ate and took some deep breaths in mm -hmm. right into their belly and get into that rest and digest state they would um absorb and digest a whole lot better and i don't think enough of us do that no um, no and I, I agree and we've lost the art of chewing that's the other thing i see so many people when i say to them do you ever chew your food and people go oh, i don't really um mm -hmm. and that makes a huge difference as well because the, the food goes through it from our stomach to our small intestines at a teaspoon at a time. So if it's got to break down big lumps, um, it makes for food sits there and ferments and brings gas back up, um, gives us bloating, all of those sorts of things. So we don't really want to be in that situation. So that, that's mm -hmm. a really easy thing people can do for their gut is to make sure that when they sit down for a meal that they're actually taking a deep breath and relaxing um, and not enough of us do it. No, no. Comes back to that mindful eating, doesn't no, it? We, uh, because we're not even enjoying the food that no. we're eating. We're just quickly having it on the run, and uh, and also, um, I think you don't stop to think how much you're eating either. Yes. Um, so that that's another issue with mindful eating. But are there any? Um, well, we've sort of talked about the foods that I've just written them down. Some for your prebiotics, fruit, vegetables, legumes, nuts and beans. And mm. and um, so with the uh, probiotics, and you were saying that not all food, fibre foods have the mm. probiotics, what would be sort of the foods that we'd need to eat for that? So for probiotics, there really is no foods. I mean, people no. talk about having fermented foods. Oh, yes. So the problem with fermented foods is a couple of things. In a prebiotic bottle, you're getting, um, they have listed on them CFU, which means colony forming units. So they'll say, this bottle has 100 million CFU um, and more is not necessarily better, folks. Um, you know, so they, they can guarantee you that on the day you open that bottle and the day you finish that bottle, there will be 100 million CFU live bacteria in this bottle. When you have a fermented food that you've made at home, couple of things is you don't know what the strains are in it. You don't know um, how much of each strain is in it. You don't know even if the strains that you're accumulating are even beneficial to your gut. Um, and so if you're using it to treat a condition, say you were using it to treat um, bacterial vaginosis, which you can buy probiotics for bacterial vaginosis. There's been studies yes. done. Yeah. yeah. So even if we were treating that, your sauerkraut will make a difference to your overall gut, but it won't help you treat that condition that you're that you're trying to treat. So if you are treating a condition, again, I say it's best to find the one, um, the probiotic that will help, whereas a fermented food won't help with that. It'll just change the environment. Um, it also, fermented foods do good things. They're just not as strong as a probiotic and you just don't know what you're getting. That's the other thing. So... Mm. 
Mm. Um, so it pays to have a mix of both if you're going to do it. Yes, yes, okay. So if you're someone that, um, you know, we're just feeling bloated or, or we're just not feeling good, what's the starting point? Should we go and see someone like you, a naturopath or another health professional, um, and chat to them about it first, or what? What would your suggestions be to new clients? So, so Sue, for for the um, for your audience, I think it's really important to remember for women over fifty, um, if there's any changes in your bowel movement, if you've always gone every day and then you no longer go every day, that's a trip to the doctor. Um, mm -hmm. If you um, have got blood in your stool or excess mucus in your stool, that's a trip to the doctor. If anything changes that hasn't been happening before, I would suggest you go to your doctor to start with. So, for example, if you've never experienced reflux or bloating or burping um, or excess gas that smells bad, that's a trip to the doctor. Um, and that just ticks a couple of boxes then. Um, the doctor will ask you for a stool test or something like that. So I think that's a really first start is the best place to go. Um, Mm, mm, and, and yes then, and then work your way out from there yeah because i know for example blood in the stool can be an indication of bowel cancer mm -hmm. and and that sort of thing so and, and it can also be a hemorrhoid um yes and, and i think it's a really good thing to to get that differentiation done quickly you know because mm. for women probably for men um more often than women Men will never go to the doctor, where women would see blood and we'd go, oh, we have to go to the doctor. Um, men, not so much. Uh, so I think it's a really important thing that if you do see that, that you do take yourself off and, and get checked to make sure it, if it is a hemorrhoid that it can be fixed quickly because the longer you leave a hemorrhoid um, and it's not fixed, they can't actually fix it as effectively as they could if you'd have gone straight away. Um, so I mm -hmm. think it's always... I think it's always um, prudent to go and see the doctor and and get that um, you know overall checkup, so you're not worried about it and you're not constantly thinking about it and you're taking action on it. Mm. Well, that's right. And if it could be anything that's worse than that, you know, that's yeah. life threatening, you don't want to leave it leave no. it go. You need to go and get it checked out. Yeah. Um, so just tell me before we go, I'm interested in what a naturopath does. Could you just so give us a little bit about that? Yeah. So I do lots of things. So I teach people how to eat um, good things for their body, you know, and, and diet, diet, the diet culture um, worldwide has become so phenomenal um, in the last couple of years. Everybody's got a diet that you should follow. Um, yeah. And I think that diet culture is really wrong because not everybody can do, um, for example, keto diet. Uh, lots of people love the keto diet, but if you've had your gallbladder out, it's probably not going to be a great diet for you um, because you can no longer absorb fat and it's mostly fat. So it could turn into you would have um, massive diarrhea and stuff. So I teach people what's right for them. And I do lots of stuff around fruit and vegetables and, and foods that you can eat. Um, I think the other very important thing is um, I help you do testing if you need it. I'm not a huge tester, but, you know, if you've had an ongoing chronic condition for a uh, you know, a number of years, I think that's a good time to get a test so you can stop trying to figure it out and, and find the source of what's happening for you. Um, I, I also um, do lots of education around um, body systems and how your body system should work. You know, lots of people don't, we, we've lost touch with our bodies and, and how um, that works for us or against us. So I do lots of um, education around that. Um, but mostly for me, I spend lots of time helping people improve conditions that they've had, um, either to eradicate them or if they've had them for a really long time, just to be able to help them manage them um, as best as they can because I think that can be quite, um, you know, hard for people to have to accept that they've got this, especially like autoimmune conditions that, that might not necessarily be able to find a cure for, but but dealing in um, managing it the best way they can so they can have still have a really great life. Mm, mm. And do you think that there's um, anything in particular that women over 50, perhaps, men, you know, post-menopausal women yeah. or women going through menopause uh, can do to um, improve their, you know, I think you suggested that gut health can also be affected by hormones and that yep. sort of thing. So, of yep. course, that's, you know, menopause is 
yeah. is a great one for that. So um, I think the thing is that with all women's issues, um, most of the women issues over time have all been studied on men. Go figure that. <laughs> Um, so a lot of research has been actually, even endometriosis research has all been done on men. There's not really many studies and stuff out about women. So that's slowly starting to change in the last uh, three to five years, really. Um, so we don't really know what effects hormones have, but they, they are starting to think now that estrogen, that losing of the estrogen does affect our our um, gut bacteria. They also um, know that gut bacteria affects our bone density and our bone health. So that's a really, um, that's a really quite new and exciting um, discovery that they found in the last couple of years. So I think for menopausal women, I think there's things that we can do to improve our health. Is one get on top of our stress, you know, because as postmenopausal women, we're generally looking after um, older parents. Um, yes taking care of grandchildren and that sort of stuff. Um, so I think there's that double whammy in there and it can be also a time for women who have more freedom than they've ever had. Um, it's a time when uh, relationships break down from marriages that have been on too long. So I would encourage people to take care of what's happening for them in that moment rather than try and soldier on um, and take more care of themselves because we seem to be that caregiver mode at, at that sort of age and we forget that we also need that care. You know, we don't um, have that same energy or same output that we did when we were 30 or 40 and we sometimes forget that. Um, mm. Mm. So I think that they're really important things to remember um, going through menopause and, and that sort of stuff. And and we can't eat as much as we once did and we have to move more than we once did. Um, but I, I But also I... I see lots of um, gym places and that that encourage uh, women over 50 to work really hard when they exercise and stuff. And, and that's not necessarily a good thing for women either to be um, crunching out, um, you know, exercise every day of the week, real hard, intense exercise. And that's not good for gut bacteria either. So I would encourage women to find um, activities that they love to do and do them frequently um you know four or five times a week um but you don't have to kill yourself doing it no i mean we were talking about this before we came on yeah. air that it's a matter about finding some form of activity or movement that you really enjoy yeah. uh and and just doing that you don't have to be slogging away at something that you absolutely hate because yeah. you're not going to enjoy it but even just going for brisk walks and and just doing a bit of strength training but uh, you don't have to um, be you know training for the Olympics or no. anything like that yeah. so that's a good point to make and there's, there's, good ev there's good evidence that the harder we train in that really heavy duty high intensity mode all the time it raises our cortisol quite a, a lot and it and it st starts to store fat rather than let go of fat um, so even though you're you're exercising enough that you should be losing weight your body will be storing it because it's it's un it feels like it's under attack because it's got that um, energy driver all the time, um, feels like it's under attack, so it won't let you lose weight. And and that's a common thing I hear with women going through menopause. I've just got this weight coming out of nowhere and I don't know what to do with it. Um, mm -hmm. Now, that's, that's a really interesting point because uh, that is an issue. You'll hear women saying, oh, I'm exercising, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, and they're probably trying to starve themselves as well. But... Um, not realizing that uh, it, it it isn't really the ideal situation for yeah. them. I mean, I'm a big one for making sure you have your rest and recovery days yeah. and things like that because yeah. your body just Needs look. It. We, it yeah, and I mean, we can say that we are ageless and all of that, but let's face it, my body's been around for sixty three years and. It's doing, it's really supporting me well and it's going well. But uh, you just have to be sensible, I think, mm -hmm. with your eating and with your exercising um, to find that good balance between keeping really, you know, healthy and active, um, but also not sort of um, tiring your body out too much, giving it that time to recover because, okay. um, yeah. Okay. So, 
Yeah, look, I just wanted to mention too, we had a message uh, earlier in the um, conversation from one of our listeners, Kathy. She's written, hi, Sue and Ange, I'm enjoying this information about gut health as someone who has issues. So that's great. Thank, Thank you, you for, for letting us know, Kathy. And, and as I said, we're hopefully going to get um, Ange back on a regular basis in the podcast yeah. and perhaps for some Facebook lives as well because it's all about my goal is to present information and uh, for us all to learn to live well and that's um, that's where I come in and if I can get people on here on Facebook lives to, to help us um, do that, then my mission is uh, accomplished. Now, Kathy's just got a question if you've got time. Yeah, no, got um, okay, thanks, Kathy. Uh, I sometimes suffer from reflux and I feel that it is bread that causes it. Mm -hmm. What food should I avoid? Oh, look, I think for some people, bread can be an issue. Depends what else is going on for you, you know, um, whether you're moving your bowels regularly, whether you're, um, whether you are eating food when you're in rest and digest rather than in fight or flight, uh, those things will make a difference to if you get reflux. Um, and sometimes it's not necessarily the bread, it could be what you're putting on the bread that could be problematic. Um, so there's lots of um, different answers that I could answer to that um, question, but question. it can be definitely problematic for some people. We have more sensitivities that some people have more sensitivities to bread, and so and and like I was talking about before, sometimes it's not the bread per se; it's what's being put onto the bread. For example, you know, was it grown with a pesticide, and and they find that um, glyphosate that's you know sprayed everywhere on everything to kill weeds and stuff is one of the big drivers of why people react to bread so badly. It's not necessarily the bread. It's what's sprayed on the bread. So um, some, it's just not always as easy as going, oh, yeah, it's that one thing, um, you know, because that's a little bit reductionist and we need to look at the whole picture of what's happening with you as a person and that's um, tricky at times. Yeah. And um, is there a particular type of bread that you would suggest is better for us and our gut? I know that they suggest, you know, white bread is not that great but and and they're more about the high fiber or the um the mixed grains the whole meal that yeah. sort of thing what would you suggest we don't have to cut it out of our diet completely i don't know i know but... celiac i don't think you do i, I mean no. or if you have some gut trouble, troubles maybe you do for a little while but i don't i don't encourage people to do that forever and i certainly don't encourage people to cut bread out of their diet until they've actually um been tested for celiac disease um, because celiac disease is a, is a life-threatening condition um, and I hear lots of people in, in forums and stuff say, oh, I was told to cut out bread before I had a test for celiac and, and you know, it would have saved me years of heartache if I'd have known that I was celiac straight away. So I encourage people to um, go and do that test first. It's a blood test that you can get from your doctor um, and it's worthwhile doing if you're having real issues with wheat. Um, there are some, so we talked about prebiotics before. Rye is a fantastic prebiotic. So rye sourdough is even better. I love a sourdough because it um, is uh, fermented for a long time. So even though it doesn't have massive amounts of, um, it, it doesn't really have many probiotics, but it does have the same sort of effect as a probiotic would. would. Um, having a long, slow fermented sourdough is probably a really good thing. Um, okay. Yeah. So perhaps if you are, you know, are experiencing symptoms long term, it's best just to go along to the GP as a yeah. start, and then yeah, yeah. Uh, and, 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 and have that blood say, test. At, yeah, I would say things. Look at things like um, bloating. What the doctor will run you through a series of tests that uh, if you're bloated, um, what could that be? Could it be celiacs? Could it be um, you've got Helicobacter, uh, which is a, a like a, a pathogenic bacteria? Could it be, you know, a couple of other things? Are you digesting um, carbohydrates properly? Um, all of those sorts of things. And they can tick those boxes at the outset. Um, unfortunately, you don't always get the answers you want from the doctor, but it's a really good place to start. Mm. And then, of course, after you've done that, they could, if they want to go to someone like you, they've got that option as well for a bit yeah. of an alternative yeah. opinion and, yeah. and uh, treatment. So, yeah. so that's good. Well, I think we've really covered a lot in a short time yeah. today and uh, that's been really interesting and um, I, I hope that the viewers 
feel that they've you know learned something more i know i have and uh and i as i i think i said before going back to that uh, probiotic i just take the supplement not even realizing that perhaps it might not be right for me so there's lots of things we need to do to educate ourselves but yeah. um what i'll be doing Ange, is also putting in some links to uh to your website and and uh um any way that people can connect with you if they want to know some more information and uh, have a chat to you about that and uh, i just hope that everyone's enjoyed today and i thank you so much for joining me this afternoon thanks for having me i can't wait to come back to do my poo talk that's always oh. a crowd <laughs> okay we might have to work out what time to have that <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but no, that's that's a topic too. So um, we've got lots we could talk about, and uh, it's just so lovely to. Um, we've this is the first time we've really chatted, so it's lovely to have met you, and uh, I uh, look forward to our next conversation. That's great, Sue. Thanks so much. Have a that's good all right. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us, and have a lovely afternoon. Bye for now. Bye.